Good Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, ceasefire after nearly two weeks of violence and mounting pressure from world leaders. Israel and Hamas have now reached an agreement to stop the bloodshed. Reaction from the president and what this means for the Middle East moving forward. Third dose. As more and more Americans receive their coronavirus shot, health experts are discussing whether a booster shot will be needed. Dr. Anthony Fauci now weighing in on the debate. Standing as one, President Biden signs a new anti-Asian hate bill as Asian American celebrities and activists come together to speak out against the troubling rise in hate incidents. My conversation with journalist Lisa Ling and basketball star Jeremy Lin on their fight. And woeful incompetence, Prince William and Prince Harry blasting the BBC this morning after an investigation into the now infamous 1995 interview with Princess Diana found that journalist Martin Bashir used deceitful behavior to secure that interview. What the princes are saying now. And a final headline of our own. Joe is back in New York. Yes. Finally close together <laughs> I know, again. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we only got that for like a day or two, and then you had to head out. How was your trip back? It was very nice. It was Thank good. For... Interesting to fly again. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And interesting on that wonky time zone over there. There's so. that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for still being here. We begin, though, this morning in the Middle East, where a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas is holding, bringing an end to 11 days of violence that claim the lives of 232 Palestinians and 12 Israelis. At 2 a.m., local time, Palestinians across Gaza and the occupied territories poured into the streets to celebrate the fragile truce, which was brokered by Egypt. Israel says it made unprecedented military gains, while Hamas is also claiming victory. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Beirut. So Raf, first of all, how did this ceasefire come together and does it look like it will continue to hold? Joe, it is 2 p.m. here in the Middle East, and the ceasefire is holding. It has been 12 hours now without a single rocket from Gaza, nor an Israeli airstrike. And that means for the first time in two weeks, Palestinian and Israeli children are able to go about a normal day without the war raging around, the, around them. Now, as you mentioned, this ceasefire was brokered by Egypt. Egypt is the traditional go-between for Israel and Hamas, who do not speak to each other directly. President Biden spoke to the Egyptian president yesterday, and when he addressed the nation from the White House, he thanked Egypt for its role in bringing about a ceasefire. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is flying to the region for the first time. One of his short-term goals, buttress that ceasefire, make sure it holds. Jeff. Raph, we know both sides have declared victory, but with all the destruction and the huge loss of civilian life, especially in Gaza, does either side feel like it has accomplished anything? Yeah, Joe, the political leadership on both sides is claiming victory. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu just the last few minutes saying Israel struck unprecedented blows against Hamas, significantly set back Hamas's battlefield capabilities. Hamas, for its part, is saying we fought Israel's militarily superior forces effectively to a draw and force them to negotiate with us. But if you speak to civilians on the ground, none of the fundamentals have changed from two weeks ago. Gaza remains a place of real misery still, and the only difference is a lot of death and a lot of destruction. Jeff. And Raf, the issues behind this conflict do go back decades, though this is the worst fighting we've seen in seven years. What is it going to take to keep this from happening again? And then what are the chances of restarting the actual peace process? Yeah, that is the big question. Gaza, Israel, the Palestinians, they are back in the news right now, but is the world going to remain focused? There have been a lot of statements for reviving the pretty much defunct two-state solution peace process. The Secretary General of the United Nations is among those calling for that revival. Take a listen to what he had to say. Israeli and Palestinian leaders have a responsibility beyond the restoration of calm to start a serious dialogue to address the root causes of the conflict. Gaza 
is an integral part of the future Palestinian state and no effort should be spared to bring about real national reconciliation that ends the division. I think it will be very important to have a robust program of humanitarian aid and recovery for Gaza. And I think it will be very important to revitalize the peace process, to restart the peace process in order to achieve the two-state solution. And one of the big questions, how much political capital does President Biden want to invest in a peace process that has got beyond most of his successors, Jeff? Raf Sanchez starting us off from Beirut. Raf, thanks so much. In the hours after Israel and Hamas agreed to a ceasefire, President Biden said he'd been in close contact with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the lead up to the deal. In my conversation with President Netanyahu, I commended him for the decision to bring the current hostilities to a close within less than 11 days. I also emphasize what I've said throughout this conflict. The United States fully supports Israel's right to defend itself against indiscriminate rocket attacks from Hamas and other Gaza-based terrorist groups that have taken the lives of innocent civilians in Israel. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins us now. Monica, good morning. So let's start by looking ahead here for a moment, especially after all of this death, all of this violence. What did President Biden say about what's next for Israel and Hamas now that this ceasefire is in place? He did look forward in those remarks yesterday, Savannah, talking about how what they hope to do is ensure peace and really uh, the ability for both Israelis and Palestinians to live and coexist. But the president also was very clear about how he expects his foreign policy, as we saw in this first real test, to continue in a way that will still be rather behind the scenes. And he said that is by design. Take a listen to how he framed it. I believe the Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. My administration will continue our quiet and relentless diplomacy toward that end. I believe we have a genuine opportunity to make progress, and I'm committed to working for it. It's those key words, quiet and relentless, to describe the diplomacy that we should keep an eye on, Savannah, because as we saw, there were more than 80 calls between the Biden administration, senior officials, and their foreign counterparts. Six of those, of course, were to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. But a lot of this was done on purpose, not publicly posturing, leaving a lot of the negotiating to the Egyptians. Yeah, so Monica, let's dig in on that a little bit more and just sort of what this means as we see this first major international crisis of the Biden administration play out. I mean, you just said it. It was in you and our colleagues' incredible reporting, this quiet yet relentless way of approaching foreign diplomacy here. What do you think this means as we look forward? I mean, this was a specific example where Biden had experience due to what happened in 2014 when he was the vice president. So he had sort of learned some lessons there. What do you think this means as we look forward and also talk us through kind of the divisions that it showed us within the Democratic Party? It really exposed those divisions, and we saw even from that conversation on the tarmac in Michigan with Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib a couple of days ago where she expressed her concerns, and there were a lot of pressure points for the president to do more, but he really stayed the course, and the strategy they set out at the beginning is the one they really did follow. But in terms of this strategy, yes, the president relied on his own experience, and we absolutely know from senior administration officials they didn't want a repeat of what happened in 2014 with those 50 plus days of fighting. And that was privately conveyed to the Israelis that the United States did not believe that would be acceptable. And they made that very clearly known. But it is a preview of how this president potentially will handle other foreign policy challenges in the years to come. And Monica, quickly, let's just talk about this humanitarian aid that's been pledged, especially as Secretary Blinken is set to make a trip to Gaza. Tell us about what we know about that trip. We know he's going to be heading there next week, and he will be meeting with Israeli, Palestinian, and other regional leaders. We don't have an exact schedule of the trip, but absolutely humanitarian aid to Gaza is going to be one part of it. And we know also that a senior administration official says they're optimistic this ceasefire will hold. There weren't any conditions attached to it, but a critical element will be discussing rebuilding in Gaza and helping those who, of course, were displaced. More than 200 dead, but hundreds others now needing to find a place to live and get back to their life in some way, Savannah. Absolutely. All right, Monica, thank you so much. Great reporting. 
The U.S. is getting closer to a potentially life-saving goal in the fight against the coronavirus. This morning, about 35 percent of American adults are fully vaccinated. More than 60 percent have received at least one shot, putting the nation on pace to reach the president's goal of 70 percent by the 4th of July. New questions are surfacing about what comes next. How long will the vaccine last? And will people need a booster shot to stay protected from COVID? Dr. Anthony Fauci says it's just suits too soon to tell. We're preparing for the eventuality that we might need boosters. But I think we better be careful not to let the people know that inevitably X number of months from now, everyone's going to need a booster. That's just not the case. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to help break all this down. So, Dr. Azar, those comments from Dr. Fauci come as the CEOs of both Pfizer and Moderna say some Americans may need boosters as soon as September. Clearly, we're learning as we go here. But what do we know about how long the current vaccine protects us from COVID? Well, Joe, the most important thing I think that people need to understand is that we only have as much data as we have. The original vaccine trial participants are being followed and their antibody levels are being measured at regular intervals. And the last we heard a few months ago was that at the six month mark, their antibody levels had not really waned significantly, which is very, very encouraging. But I always like to point out to our viewers, too, that we're not just talking about antibody levels. There is another arm of the immune system that's called the T cell immunity, which is very, very durable, which is very likely to also provide, you know, long, longer term prediction. But the short answer is Dr. Fauci said. It's just we don't know. Will it be like tetanus once every 10 years? Will it be like flu once a year? We just don't have enough data yet to let people know that. It's so strange to be going through this almost in real time. In Uh, real time. How will we know when that protection does wear off? So I think, you know, experts are going to be looking at a number of things. One, are we going to start seeing breakthrough cases that are not mild or asymptomatic, but are the landing people in the hospital? Are we going to start seeing breakthrough cases with variants that are concerning because they're either much more transmissible or they are more virulent? And finally, are we going to start seeing vaccinated people transmitting to others? Those are just a couple of parameters and metrics that I think public health and infectious disease experts are going to be looking at to say, you know what, guys, it's probably Probably time to start boosting. Let's talk about the stuff we can do now. We mentioned that more than six in 10 adults have now received at least one shot. Could the actual pace of the vaccinations actually affect how soon we would need a booster or if we'll even need one at all? Absolutely. Always, always, always remember the mantra that the virus is going to mutate if it has an opportunity to replicate. And the only way it replicates is if it finds susceptible hosts. So the more people we get vaccinated more quickly, the less place the virus will have to land, the less opportunity it has to replicate and ultimately mutate. Hence, the push to vaccinate continues. (laughs) I feel like there's a song in there that someone could write with some words <laughs> and a rhyme or something. I don't know. Work. Let's work on that. All right. All right. Dr. Azar, as always, thank you so much. The death of soccer legend Diego Maradona is under new scrutiny this morning, according to ESPN. Prosecutors in Argentina have charged seven medical professionals with simple homicide with eventual intent. This comes after an investigation requested by the prosecutors found the medical treatment of the star was, quote, inappropriate, deficient and reckless. Telemundo's Julio Vaquero joins us now. Julio, good morning. Thank you for being with us now. I mean, soccer fans around the world were shocked by this death. So who's being charged? What are they accused of doing exactly? Hey, Zavanna, thanks for having me. So, yes, basically, we're talking about seven health professionals. Among them are doctors, nurses, nurse coordinators. And we have to remember that Maradona died on November past year. Uh, two weeks before dying, he underwent a uh, brain surgery. And the people who are being charged right now are the people who were supposed to take care of him. Uh, So we have Leopoldo Luque, who was his uh, surgeon. He was his main doctor, uh, his psychiatrist. Both of them have denied any wrongdoing so far. Uh, Also, the nurses, two nurses who were taking him directly, taking care of him directly on the day he died. Um, The nurse coordinator, uh, a psychologist and another doctor. Uh, Basically, what prosecutors are saying is that uh, they they didn't take care of him properly, that there was negligence on, on this case. 
And Julio, I know that he had a long history of substance abuse and that conversation has come up. Did that play any role here? Well, I think that's a, a tricky answer to that one because not directly. I mean, the autopsy didn't find any um, un, uh, illegal substances, any drugs, any alcohol on Maradona's body. Uh, however, uh, it is true that he had a long history of drug abuse and his health was already in a very, very bad situation. So uh, in many cases, uh, in the past years and there were false alarms suggesting that he was already dead and they weren't true in this case well it was it was uh, it was true mm. and also he was a cultural icon i mean it transcended sport i'm not the sportiest person and you know i know all about this story because of how much of an icon he was what has the reaction been like in his home country of argentina hearing this news now well you're right he was he was a legend and many in argentina uh, consider him a god and so we're not exaggerating when we say that mm. people loved him in his mm -hmm. own country and after finding about finding out about his death well people were extremely sad they went out to the streets and they were sharing their pain because of his his death now these these past months have been even more painful because people are learning how how bad he was uh, treated on his last couple of days uh, the lack mm. of medical uh, treatment he received and now these new piece of information are it's, it's just making things more difficult to soccer fans and people in Argentina in general. Absolutely. All right, Julio. Well, we know that there will be a lot more to talk about here as that trial gets underway. So we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's now get a check on your morning news now weather. Bill Karen's joined us in what has been a very busy weather week. Hey, Bill. Yeah, and it looks like this weekend things are going to quiet down a little mm. bit, but, you know, the tropics are starting to heat up, which we'll talk about that next hour. So first, let's deal with what's caused all the issues this week, and that's the flash flooding. It has been relentless day after day. You're probably sick of me even talking about it unless you live in that area. Um, seven inches of rain in Houston this week. We've had a foot of rain in New Orleans. I mean, it's been pretty widespread. Even Dallas picked almost five inches of rain. But the two cities that really were hit the hardest, Victoria, Texas, had 16 inches of rain this just in the beginning of May here, they've had 40% of their annual rainfall. And how about the poor people in Lake Charles, Louisiana? Almost 20 inches of rain this mm. week alone. Third wettest May on record already. And that's 30% of their annual rainfall in just the beginning of May. So we still have a flash flood watch for those areas, especially the Lake Charles area, the Shreveport, the Texarkana, and New Orleans included too. We're going to get some additional heavy rainfall today. It's not going to be widespread, but some areas that get thunderstorms could see up to six inches additional rain. And it's very summer-like today, east of the Rockies. Uh, look at the 80s, widespread Great Lakes, northeast. And then in the the cool spot this weekend and, uh, you know, and today is definitely the northern Rockies. Look at Saturday, summer warmth covering everywhere east of the Mississippi, and it's going to be summer-like on Sunday, 90 degree possible in New York City, 92 in D.C., so it's a, you know, the end of this weekend is definitely trying to find a pool, a lake, or the ocean, and except the ocean's a little chilly this time of year, yeah. but uh, yeah, at least it'll be cool. I'll clean it out. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. All right, Bill, thank you. We'll see you in a little bit. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks for the tease for the next hour also. <laughs> Coming up, businesses that are reopening and eager to get back to normal are hitting a bit of a snag. Some people don't want to come back to work. How a handful of states are trying to solve that problem with cold, hard cash up next. Connecticut and New Hampshire are now offering cash incentives to get the unemployed back to work. Many business owners say their help wanted signs have been out so long they're collecting dust because workers are choosing to collect unemployment instead. So Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont is offering $1,000 to as many as 10,000 people who go back to their old shifts at restaurants and stores. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us now from Greenwich, Connecticut. So, Kathy, tell us, first of all, what's behind this? Why are some people choosing not to go back to work? And are the business owners hopeful that cash incentives could actually lure workers back and maybe ease this worker shortage? Hey, Joe, good morning to you. As you know, the pandemic dealt a crushing blow to the workforce. And a lot of people ended up leaning on both state and federal unemployment benefits. And the concern now moving forward is that some people will continue to sit on the sidelines, continue to con collect the $300 federal check until it expires at the end 
of the summer. Another concern is child care. As you know, a lot of parents are starting to get back to work. So for some people, it makes sense for one parent to just stay at home. And then lastly, uh, COVID is still here. We are still in this pandemic, although things are starting to trend in the right direction. Um, and some people in the workforce, they're still hesitant to dive right in because of the fear of potentially getting the virus. But as far as this incentive goes here in Connecticut, um, the reaction is is pretty mixed because you have some people who say, yes, this will spur up some movement to get people back to work. But then there are people who say we have offered job security for the better part of the year. Where is our bonus? So uh, you have that twofold reaction there, Joe. So Connecticut is not alone here, Kathy. What are other states doing to either convince workers to return to their pre-pandemic jobs or maybe even to try and put some pressure on them to get them back to work? Well, there are some states like New Hampshire, Montana, Oklahoma. Those states will actually be ending or opting out of the the federal unemployment program in uh, the better part of the middle of June. It kind of depends on which state you're in. Uh, But as an incentive, they'll do something similar to what they're doing here in Connecticut and offering uh, some sort of bonus for the unemployed who go back to work and stay in that job for an extended period of time, Joe. All right, Kathy Park, thanks so much. It is time for this week's edition of Good to Know and that pretty new graphic. This morning, we've got a popular toy maker making history, the latest way to enjoy concerts from the comfort of your home and more. Here's our friend, NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent, Vicki Wynn. Hey, good morning. May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. Google's launching a new tool to help people find answers about common skin conditions. Just take three pictures of your skin, hair, or nails, answer a few questions, and let the artificial intelligence give you a list of possible conditions. Google's still testing the technology and hopes to launch the Dermatology Assist tool later this year. Just promise me you will not freak out until you talk to an actual doctor. All right, here's a question. Should you place a dryer sheet in your mailbox? A post on Reddit went viral after a mail carrier suggested a dryer sheet can prevent insects like wasps and yellow jackets from building homes inside your mailbox. It's not scientific, but it seems to work. If you've tried it, let me know if it helps. Apple is making it easier for users who rely on sign language to communicate with others. The company launched a new accessibility feature called Sign Time this week, which allows users to communicate with customer service in-store and online by using American Sign Language. Lego is all about building, and now the bricks are building unity. Lego has unveiled its first LGBTQ-themed set. They're calling it Everyone is Awesome. The company says the Lego set was inspired by the rainbow flag, which is used as a symbol of love and acceptance by the LGBTQ community. You can get the new set June 1st, the day that kicks off Pride Month. Ready to rock out from the comfort of your couch? Spotify is entering the world of virtual concerts, so no need to elbow your way to the front row. Music fans can now buy tickets for $15 a pop to five different concert streams that are airing throughout May and June. The pre-recorded concerts will feature artists including The Black Keys and Leon Bridges. Oh yeah, count me in. For News Now, I'm Vicki Wynn, and that's good to know. And now let's get a look at your what's making news around the world this morning. I, think I almost introduced the money minute there. <laughs> <laughs> Please, financial headlines. It's Friday. Friday. <laughs> no, first our international headlines with Matt Bradley in London. Hey, Matt. Happy Friday. Hey, happy Friday, guys. I'm going to start you off in Nigeria, where there's been a startling new development with regards to that fighting between Islamist militant groups in Nigeria. You remember the Bring Back Our Girls campaign demanding that Islamist militants in West Africa release 300 schoolgirls, and that was back in 2014. Well, during fighting between jihadi group Boko Haram and Islamic State or ISIS, the leader of Boko Haram, and that's the man behind the abduction of those girls, he seriously injured himself when he tried to commit suicide to avoid capture by the rival militants. Now, we don't know. We got different word from intelligence officials in Nigeria. They said that he maybe had tried to shoot himself in the shoulder uh, or he may have tried to detonate explosives. Either way, this well-known fugitive has been badly wounded and his fate remains unclear. 
And here's some news that may not surprise you. Anthony Blinken, he's the US Secretary of State, he's on a four-day tour of Northern European countries. He's confirmed to reporters that America is no longer in the market to buy Greenland, the enormous ice-covered island off the coast of Canada that Donald Trump had tried to buy from Denmark. Now, Greenland has some autonomy, but it ultimately belongs to Denmark, so the move makes a predi predictable departure from one of the Trump administration's kind of zanier demands. But with climate change defrosting some of the North Atlantic, Greenland has become strategically very important. So now staying on that Arctic sea ice, there's finally been a sighting of a gray whale that had been lost in the Mediterranean Sea after it swam all the way from the North Pacific Ocean. Now Wally the whale, that's his name, reappeared off the Spanish island of Majorca 10,000 kilometers from home, scientists said it took a shortcut from the Pacific Ocean by swimming through melting Arctic sea ice now, and then headed toward the balmy Mediterranean Sea. So needless to say, Wally's not in his native habitat, and scientists said he looked ill oh. and completely lost. Guys? Oh, that's, that's not good. good. Well, yeah. hopefully you'll be okay. Yeah. All right, Matt. Thank you so much. Keep watching out for Wally. Yeah. 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 Wally watch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, coming up, fighting back against the rise in anti-Asian hate in America with a new campaign. It's called See Us Unite. I talked with journalist Lisa Ling and basketball icon Jeremy Lin about the effort next. Here is a feel-good Friday story. A young woman shocked her parents when she asked to record them trying to read some tongue twisters, or so they thought. Take a look at what she really had them read. Uh, you can open it. Oh my god! This is incredible! You're kidding! I'm oh not! Oh my god! Congrats! Yeah, let me read this! Let me read this one. This is very important. Let me read it. The letter revealed Gurdjieff was accepted to optometry, optometry school at University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio. The video has been viewed nearly <laughs> 9 million times. The university even retweeted the clip, adding, we're not crying. You're crying. <laughs> I'm crying. <Love> that <laughs> that much I know. Way better than a tongue twister, too. <laughs> oh, that is so adorable. Oh, I love those videos when yeah. parents are surprised and they're so proud. That's that a, is so sweet. I mean, yeah, that's a, parent reactions to these things are like the absolute best. It so. really is. Oh, you were right. A Feel Good Friday story. Thank you, Joe. A bill to help fight anti-Asian hate crimes was signed into law by President Biden just yesterday. The COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act passed in Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support, and it will speed up the review of hate crimes and help with reporting and outreach efforts. This comes, of course, after an alarming increase in attacks on Asians and Asian Americans during the pandemic. But it's not just lawmakers taking action. Celebrities, activists, and supporters of the AAPI community are also fighting back against anti-Asian hate with a new campaign. I hate talking about all this stuff. My friends and colleagues hate talking about all this stuff because we hate what is happening. The newly formed Asian American Foundation recently launched the CS Unite campaign with the help of some familiar faces, including journalist Lisa Ling and basketball star Jeremy Lin. I spoke with them both earlier this week about the campaign and the progress of the movement to stop AAPI hate. Thank you both so much for joining and taking the time right now to talk about something so important. Lisa, I'll start with you. And you both, though, are on the advisory council of the newly formed Asian American Foundation, which launched the CS Unite campaign. Tell us more about this mission here. Well, the CS Unite campaign, uh, the way I look at it, is a way for our community that has been largely invisible for much of this country's history to really celebrate and showcase our work, mm. our stories, and our history. Because, look, we, as you mentioned, we know that we are in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and this has been a realization for so many of us that because our history isn't taught, Asian American history isn't taught in schools, um, that people don't really have a framework or an understanding mm -hmm. of the role that Asian Americans have played in this country, as well as our, 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 our co contributions and our triumphs and victories. And when you don't have 
a, a framework or an understanding, it becomes easy to overlook us and dehumanize us. And so it's been really important for us to want to get in front of this, right? Mm. And this incredible cultural campaign is going to highlight so many of those things. I think it's such a good point to think about that celebration rather than just talking about some of these awful events that we're hearing. And Jeremy, you have a career worth celebrating, certainly, and you broke some news this week with this heartfelt goodbye to the NBA. First, congrats on that incredible career. And I want to highlight part of this goodbye that has to do with this specific conversation. It reads, to the next generation of Asian American ballers, man, I so wish I could have done more on the NBA. NBA court to break more barriers, especially now. But you guys got next. When you get your shot, do not hesitate. Don't worry whether anyone else thinks you belong. I mean, first of all, just what an incredible message there. And to take this moment, looking back on your career, to say something like this, why was it important to you to send that specific message to future Asian American players? Tell me about penning that goodbye. Uh, for me, you know, a big part of, you know, I've had the, the privilege of being able to play nine years in the NBA. Um, but I think a lot of, you know, upcoming Asian American basketball players, I mean, they're going through, you know, and we're, it's funny because even now as we talk to younger players, I mean, they're going through the same thing that I was going through when I was growing up. And, and they're hearing and experiencing the same racism and they're being overlooked and they're being questioned and they have to have three, four, five good games to prove themselves versus somebody else may just need to have one. Or if they have, you know, one bad game, everybody will look at them and be like, oh, you're terrible versus, you know. And so there's always this like the evaluation process and the, the playing field is not even for Asian American basketball players. And so I just wanted to say to them, like the one thing that you guys need to understand is if you give them any reason to doubt they will but when you get that opportunity you got to go 100 percent and go all the way for it and do not hesitate do not do not question trust the work that you've put in um, because that is the truth the truth mm -hmm. is it is not an even playing field and that is what i want the next generation to, to continue to um, understand and go for and uh, hopefully they can see that through my career but you know if i don't make it if my job as a basketball player is you know has not changed for the change anything for the next generation of, of basketball players and uh, especially Asian basketball players and that would make me pretty sad. And what an important and stark way to sort of take stock the fact that you're hearing about people still dealing with the same thing that improvement hasn't been made there. Uh, Lisa, as a journalist, you've obviously had to read but also report about so many of these anti-Asian attacks and I can only imagine what that experience has been like for you. Can you just talk us through kind of how this has all made you feel, but then also how you've been able to work through it and, and work on something like this campaign that, to use your word before, can make some celebration here? Sure. And I, I just wanted to say to Jeremy that he is such a hero to mm. all of us, um, and he will continue to be. And not only do we love Jeremy Lin because <laughs> he really broke barriers and just had mad skills on the court. Uh, you know, for years, but he really, as you see, just leads with his heart. Mm. Um, and he's been so outspoken um, on this issue. And, and to your question, look, this has been weighing so heavily on all of us. And, and as mm. you showed in the clip, it's not like we like talking about these things. These are really, really hard. And it's been devastating and disheartening to see that despite how much we are talking about this, that Asian people, particularly our, our Asian elders, are still continuing to get attacked. And those of us who have a little bit of a platform, we just feel compelled. We have to be talking mm -hmm. about this and, and, and shame on us if we're not. Uh, but this is also a moment of, of inflection and reckoning, I think, for all of us, because we are starting to realize that for so long in this country, our stories haven't been told. And we've been very invisible. I mean, when you think about uh, and Jeremy was talking about he, he he has been one of the very very few Asian players to have an opportunity mm -hmm. in the uh, in the NBA. I mean, for me, I have had a show in prime time on cable for about ten years. And on the one hand, you think, wow, that's great. You know, you look at it from the outside looking in, and I, I and I wear that as a badge of pride. But I can't think of very many other Asian Americans mm -hmm. who have a regular presence on TV at all. 
And so when I think about that, it really, it, it, it's concerning and it's disheartening. And so the point of this special, this cultural campaign is to say, look, we, we're here. We belong yeah. here. See us. And, and, you know, we, we can do what everyone else can do. <laughs> we just aren't really given a fair shot. Mm. And I just think it's so important to focus this conversation on not just the enthusiasm for activism centered around these attacks, but to keep it moving forward, which is what you're doing with this campaign. Lisa Ling and Jeremy Lin, thank you so much for joining us and thanks for sharing all this with us. Thanks for having us. As part of the new campaign, the Asian American Foundation is putting on a CS Unite for Change special hosted by Ken Jeong, featuring musical and comedy performances and special appearances by celebrities and activists. It airs tonight on MTV Networks, BET, Nickelodeon and Facebook Watch. Coming up, it will likely be a blockbuster summer travel season. Our own Lester Holt sat down with the chief executive of Alaska Airlines on post-pandemic flying and the future of the battered industry. That's next. As the country reopens, many people are eager to travel. As part of his Across America series this week, NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt sat down with the CEO of Alaska Airlines to discuss the future of air travel. Savannah and Joe, this morning we continue to look at America's recovery. And here in the Seattle area, with several Boeing factories and a major airline, the future of air travel hits home. I got an inside view of that future from the CEO of Seattle-based Alaska Airlines. Early morning at SeaTac, and the lines to check in are growing. You're going to be at checkpoint number three to the left. While the vaccine has led to a rush of trips to reunite with family and leisure travel has brought crowds back to the airport, it's business travel that the airlines desperately need to make money. First time I've been at an airport in a year. Salesman David Annable is just now returning to the skies. Like many, he will travel less and continue with virtual meetings, a cost savings. I will travel more than I did during the pandemic. We'll travel less than I did prior. While they have seen an increase in leisure travel, 80 percent of pre-pandemic levels, Alaska Airlines saw just 25 percent of its normal business travel in the first quarter of the year. The carrier is hopeful it will see that double by year's end. New CEO Ben Minicucci, just two months into the job, is optimistic. The airline industry took a beating last year, and this year isn't all that pretty. How is the health of the airline? With the pace of vaccinations increasing, we saw a significant step change in March. We actually, for the first time, achieved positive operating cash flow in March after 12 months of burning cash. So things are, are, are looking more optimistic. Leisure bookings are strong, almost the pre-pandemic levels. Companies surveyed last summer showed great hesitancy in allowing travel, with 72 percent saying they would limit trips. But now, as more people are vaccinated, a recent study says 84 percent of business travelers say they cannot wait to travel again without fear of getting COVID. Most say they have missed business travel. I think I can easily say I've spent more hours on video conferencing than I have in, in the seats of airplanes. Are you worried that that may be the model going forward? Maybe six months ago, I was worried, but I think the more we get into it, we realize that people need that human interaction. I think companies uh, feel like you still need that face-to-face. -face. I think it's going to come back. Would it be your hope that the government eventually dropped the mask requirement on airplanes? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think uh, I think as vaccinations increase, I think we've proven scientifically that the environment on board the aircraft is safe, you know, with HEPA filters and the way the air circulates on the airplane. I'm hoping that the government does relax that policy, but for now, now it is a federally mandated requirement and, and we'll comply with that. Three Delta, three Foxtrot, please. A looming pilot shortage is a concern for airlines worldwide. Experts say there could be as many as 34,000 open cockpit seats in the U.S., an aging workforce facing mandatory retirement at 65. You have a sister airline here, Horizon. How is that allowing you to maybe confront this, this pilot shortage you know, before it bites you? We started something called the Pathways Program several years ago, and the purpose of the Pathways Program program was to be able to go out and uh, and find pilots who are interested to come to Alaska Air Group and, and say you, you have not only a career to come in and work for a Horizon, but you have a guaranteed interview to come work for a mainline airline. 
Alaska hires about a third of its pilots from Horizon. Alaska pilot April Ayers is a graduate of the Pathways program. She's been at Alaska for more than nine years. Pathways honestly for me changed my life in the sense that I was able to realize my career goal of being a major airline pilot in half the amount of time and starting that career off you know at a younger age uh, was everything I dreamt of when I was a child. What was the thought in creating this aircraft, the commitment as you call it? The airplane is more about us and what we need to do as a company to make sure that it's top of mind, that we hold ourselves accountable and we move the needle on racial diversity and equity over the next five years. Alaska is optimistic they will be back to normal traffic levels by summer of 2022. Savannah and Joe. All right, thanks, Lester. And coming up, Princes William and Harry are speaking out. Their comments after the scathing report on the BBC's now infamous interview of their mother, Princess Diana, next. Prince William and Prince Harry had strong words for the BBC after an investigation found one of the network's journalists used deceitful behavior to secure that notorious interview with their mother, Princess Diana. Prince William said reporter Martin Bashir's lies back in 1995 contributed to Diana's, quote, fear, paranoia and isolation before her death. NBC News correspondent Molly Hunter joins us with more on the reaction to this report. Molly, good morning. Hey guys, good morning from a very rainy, windy London this morning. But that's right, overnight Prince William and Prince Harry fired back against the BBC. And Prince Harry, we also heard from him separately, a really raw, honest conversation about his struggles living in the royal family. Take a listen. What words have you heard around mental health? Crazy? Lost it. Can't keep it together. This morning, a candid Prince Harry like we've never seen him. In the first look from his upcoming docuseries with Oprah, The Me You Can't See, he opens up about losing his mother and his mental health struggles. He talks about parting his way through the pain in his 20s before meeting Meghan and seeking therapy. And I quickly established that if this relationship was, was going to work, that I was going to have to deal with my past because there was anger there and it wasn't anger at her it was it was just anger and she recognized it she saw it he goes on to say his fears that his wife would end up like his mother was the reason they ultimately left the uk Overnight, Princes William and Harry also had strong words for the BBC about their mother and the investigation into her famous 1995 interview with Martin Bashir. It brings indescribable sadness to know that the BBC's failures contributed significantly to her fear, paranoia and isolation that I remember from those final years with her. Prince Harry echoing his older brother, our mother lost her life because of this and nothing has changed. Five times a day. 25 years after 20 million people watched that interview. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Now, an independent inquiry has found that Bashir lied to both Diana's brother and to the BBC to obtain the interview. It is my view that the deceitful way the interview was obtained substantially influenced what my mother said. The interview was a major contribution to making my parents' relationship worse. The report also accuses the public broadcaster of a cover-up. The BBC has apologized publicly, but also in letters to the brothers. In a statement, Bashir also apologized, but pointed to this letter, published for the first time as evidence alongside the report. On Kensington Palace Stationery, Diana wrote in December of 1995, she had no regrets. Now, Bashir says he is still immensely proud of that interview. We should say he has left the BBC because of health concerns. And we also have to note that he used to work for MSNBC. Joe? Molly, I also have a question about Harry speaking with Oprah, talking more about Meghan's struggle with suicidal thoughts. What are we learning more from this interview? That's right. And I think actually this kind of tees up a whole docu-series of really powerful, raw conversations. But we did hear Megan talk to Oprah about that, of course, in their interview. She said she was having very real suicidal thoughts. And in this new conversation, Harry says that he, confi- he, he talks to Oprah about the night that Megan confided. And he says uh, he, she was so afraid of hurting him, of him losing another person that he loved. He also says, Joe, that he was ashamed with how he reacted. And he was so angry that then that night that she confided, they had to go outside, get dressed, be in front of cameras, smile, act like everything was okay when everything quite clearly was not okay. Joe Savannah. All right, Molly, thank you so much. And if you or someone you know is struggling, help is available 24 7 
at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number there is 1-800-273-8255, or you can text the word TALK to 741741. They say those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Stay tuned. Digital reporter Maya Eaglin spoke with one organization using augmented reality to educate the next generation about the racism in our country's past. We're not seen, we're not properly represented, and we're written out of the past, present, and future in a lot of ways. Whether it's in textbooks, whether it's public spaces, whether it's just our collective narratives, it's all super Eurocentric, and a lot of it's about white male slaveholders, and we're just trying to flip the script. We originally started off advocating for racist statutes to go down in New York City, and we did various performance pieces uh, in protests. But at the end of the day, Mayor de Blasio only removed one statue, and we saw this opportunity with augmented reality to put up our own statues without permission, really. Movers and Shakers is a company that believes dismantling racism starts with educating the next generation. And that's how Kinfo Gayar was born. We use augmented reality to write black and brown history into American curricula. We saw that we can impact the youth and really speak to stories that have been historically excluded and written out in the textbooks and in the classroom and help students become agents of their own learning. You can literally bring someone like Shirley Chisholm into your own living room, into your own classroom. You can then resize her and then you'd switch to learn mode and that opens up information about her. Who are some of the other icons that we're going to see inside this app? There's Toussaint Louverture, there's Shirley Chisholm, we have Frederick Douglass, Paulie Murray, Ida B. Wells, and Byron Rustin. One of my co-founders, Idris Brewster, and I, we, we have Haitian and Caribbean ancestry, so Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, huge for us. Right now, we're at the stage where we're looking to work with other historians and educators to fully populate this platform and to build out more monuments. So like Marsha Johnson, for example, a black trans activist, we need an artist that represents that community, an educator that represents that community to really tell that story. And so can you use the app in any location or do you have to go to some of these historical sites to see the augmented reality? If you're in Richmond, Virginia and you can't stand looking at the Confederate generals, you can go over to Monument Avenue, you can open up the Kinfolk app and you can digitally replace them. But if you're in Inglewood, California, and maybe that's a little far, you can do it literally from the comfort of your own home. And so that's the thing, accessibility is of uh, paramount importance to us. doesn't matter where you are or who you are, you can see these stories. During the summer of 2020, there was a call to remove Confederate statues. Over 130 of them were taken down nationwide, including statues of people like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. All of this following calls for racial justice after the police killing of George Floyd, which sparked a new wave of protests around the world. But with over 700 Confederate monuments still standing in the U.S. today, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Glenn believes there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Bottom line is, most black people in America have to walk around and look up at statues who would have owned them. Like, if you go to our textbooks, we learn about Dr. King, we learn about Rosa Parks, we learn about the slaves, and I'm sure the kids are probably learning about Obama right now, but like, that's about it, right? And so there are all these efforts to actually make these structural changes, but that takes time. And like, you look around, you look at the place our country's in, the writing's on the wall. We need to do things differently. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.